Welcome to Sacred Magic. Violet is on a quest to bring sacredness back into our everyday experiences. Anyone can have an extraordinary life when they're able to tap into their sacred magic within. Violet and her guests will be sharing their divine passions, inspirations, and stories of connecting with their sacred magic. We are so happy you have joined us today. Let's get started with your host, the magical creator of Discover Your Spiritual Gifts, Violet Rain. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sacred Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Rain, and I'm excited today for our guest. And I'm also excited because my voice is working this morning. You, those that listen periodically know that some days I sound like a frog and sometimes I sound like myself. So I'm glad today to sound like myself. But my guest today is best-selling author, speaker, and educator, Jessica Goldmonts Stokes is an entrepreneur of the heart, always seeking her own growth and truth. She teaches and performs belly dance and practices therapeutic touch and Reiki. She's a daughter, a mom, a wife, a friend, and a caregiver. She's navigated multiple family members with Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson. She's an avid labyrinth walker, a trained Vertitas labyrinth facilitator, a published author, of several books that we're going to talk about today. And I probably butchered like half the words in her bio. Um, it's just who I am. You'll learn to laugh and go on. But welcome, Miss Jessica, to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I love that we get to chat today. So Jessica is one of our team members at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts in Centennial, Colorado. She's just joined us recently and I've gotten to get to know her. It's funny, we moved our center last fall in October from Littleton, which is south of Denver, to Centennial. And she used to be one of our customers and I had never met her. And when she discovered that we were in the same building as the business that she worked at, she got so excited. So I really got to meet her for the first time I believe really in October, um, November, that time frame, and we've been connecting ever since. It's been like, I think it was divinely guided, if I had to say, divinely guided for us to meet. So welcome, Jessica, to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. Well, I too feel like it's been divine intervention, Violet, and I feel like the world and the universe said, here, this is an opportunity for you two to connect and be friends and, and find some ways to, to work together. So it's a joy and a pleasure to get to be here chatting with you today. I love that. She's a practitioner in her center and also a teacher. She facilitates belly dancing in the center. Um, she talks about labyrinths a lot, and I just thought a labyrinth was something fun to play in. And so I can't wait to talk to her today for her perspective, because she is passionate about labyrinths and how we can use them for healing, which I don't even know how we can do that. But let's first start with, tell us a little bit of the history of labyrinths. Sure. So labyrinths have been around for really uh, pretty much as long as we can remember, remember, or as long as we know. There are cave dwellings that have a labyrinth type shape in them. So we know that we can see uses of labyrinths going back really for as long as we, as long as our human history has started to draw and make shapes. And if you think about the basic drawing or the basic shape of a labyrinth is really a spiral. And think back to any times in which you were doodling as a kid in school, one of the really simple, easy shapes we often make is a circle or that labyrinth. It's, or I'm sorry, a spiral shape. So it's a very simple shape that gives us a lot of joy as humans to draw and to connect with. There's the, the history we often think about. Um, many people have a reference to the, there's a Greek myth with Dionysus or with the Minotaur and Theseus. Theus. I'm, I'm betraying names too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on, on the island of Crete, there's a Minotaur and a, um, a, a story about labyrinths. 
um, that story's been often replayed. And then there's that movie from the 80s, the Labyrinth movie with David Bowie, which is another one that lots of people have connections to. And I have to say that that movie is incorrect. That movie should be actually called The Maze, not The Labyrinth. So one of the basic things about a labyrinth, as we know it today, is it's one, it's a unicircle. So it goes inside one way and out the other way. So we are not, it is not a maze. So if we think about the corn mazes that we go to in um, with for fun um, with our kids in the fall and whatnot, those are meant to confuse us. In the movie, The Labyrinth with David Bowie, we were meant to get confused. He, there was a series of things that the kids go through and they get stuck. They get caught in, you know, fall through a chute and different things like that. So uh, throughout history, then the, the church um, got really connected and loved the idea of the labyrinth. It often is, it's been used in the Catholic church as a way to reference a path or a journey or a um, um, uh, pilgrimage, and we've seen that repeated and used in a lot of different motifs in churches through the centuries. One of the most famous labyrinths is in the Notre Dame in Paris on the floor of the cathedral and of Chart, the Chart Cathedral, and that's the labyrinth that we see repeated many, many times over in modern, in the more modern representations. I could so go on and on, Violet. Do you I want know, me to keep this going? Is, <laughs> this is like your passion. I know that. But it's interesting because you offer and a lot of times talk about healing through the labyrinth. And I think what happens with that is people don't understand what you're talking about. How can you heal through a labyrinth? How can yeah. you utilize a labyrinth for healing? So share a little bit of that perspective. Sure. So there's so there's really two, you know, the labyrinth pattern has been used to walk. So we have lots of different labyrinths in which we can go and physically walk. The, there's been a resurgence, which really became out of the pandemic of handheld or um, um, finger labyrinths. And I have a couple examples that I'm going to show. So I hope this, I don't know if you can yeah, see this. Yeah, I can see picture. that. So this is a wooden one. It's a really beautiful dark wood, walnut one. And what it is, is you can put your finger in and trace it. I'm gonna show a couple others just for fun. This is a smaller one. And then these are some cards that show different patterns of different types and styles of labyrinths throughout the world and ones that people have made. So the interesting thing about all the patterns, this one is really quite um, complicated looking. Mm -hmm. so, so these patterns and these circles, so how it can connect to our healing journey. So we certainly can take, there, there's some ways in which we can relate to the labyrinth and there really is no right or wrong way to relate to it. If you stumble upon one on your journey, you can, just walk it for fun. You can dance through it. We don't really know the full true reason labyrinths began. Um, we know different examples of things in which people have, how they have related to them over the years and how, what's become of it today. But you can dance, you can play. It might've been used at some point for ritual or for, to, to again, represent a journey. So when, and the work that I do with folks when we use the labyrinth is that we set an intention before we're, we're going to do the labyrinth journey. And we typically do it together or I have the person take, there's some different ways. You can trace it with your finger or this one actually has a little stylus. And so you can start at the beginning and as you set your intention and as you, while you're going in, so you literally, follow the path. I don't know if I can do this in um, the Zoom call. <laughs> um, but so you follow the path. And then as you come to the different corners, you trace the labyrinth. And so what can happen for a person as they set an intention or set a question, 
And as we're walking in, we're really reflecting or we're tracing in, we're really reflecting and, and relating to that question. Sometimes people can have really profound shifts in per consciousness and their perspective as they're opening up and shifting. It's, it's a way to sort of lighten the veil or, or shift their ways of being or connect in on a deeper level from where they're the brain and it's, it's a basically it's a way to do a meditation really and then when you get to the center there's this sense of profound openness or profound letting in and things messages can come in at that moment it really shifts and opens someone's perspective and it creates this um really a portal if you will to a different way of being in a space so typically when I'm bringing a person in for a session, at that point, often, then we'll do some work. So then I'll have them, you know, lay down on my table and we do some some different kinds of energy work. It's a time in which people can really get, get connected and open up in some different ways. And then at the end of the session, then we'll go back to that center and then trace our way out. And in the tracing out, we're really letting ourselves absorb or reflect upon what happened and really relate to the experience that we have and ultimately close the experience. I so love it's that. Really... It's, it's very similar to tracing meditation. There are lots of forms where people can take um, chopsticks and trace a painting or a diagram for meditation. What happens with that process is your tracing, it gives your mind something to focus on, right? Absolutely. Because we have mental chatter and all this stuff happening. So it gives your mind something to focus on, which allows your subconscious, that, that higher level of consciousness to really be able to connect and communicate with you because now the mind has something to focus on as you're tracing. And that's where we get messages. Same idea with coloring. When I used to be really stressful in a job, what I noticed is I got adult coloring books and on my stressful days, I would come home and color. And what it allowed was for me to release the tension of the day in something that was very creative. It didn't matter whether I finished it or not but just allowed my mind to kind of slow down a little bit, relax a little bit, kind of move into a different state of energy. And so I can see where that'd be really powerful. I also love the idea that you trace in, then you do a session, and then you trace back out, like the closing of completion of the healing session. You know, she's been such an influence that I also bought a wooden... <laughs> <laughs> labyrinth it's in my office to trace it's heart shape it's all her fault um because she got us into that but you've also written a book about labyrinths so share that a little i have bit. yeah so my journey my personal journey through labyrinths actually i have an interesting funny story that i've been recently remembered is that actually my first introduction to a labyrinth was when i was in um it's this really funny story. I was, at, well, maybe not funny, it's amusing. Um, when I was in high school, I went on this summer trip and we did some, um, it was a trip in Europe and it was like a summer adventure trip with um, some of my classmates. And one of the places we went was to Crete and we only spent a day, it was an afternoon and we were in Crete and we did a tour. And one of the things that they were speaking of was the the labyrinth there. And it was one of the first times I had even heard of what this was. And I did a little bit of reading the the um, the um, Greek myths about it, but it was really my first true introduction to the labyrinth. Um, and then and the segue is my mom and my aunt in the late 90s, both also became interested in labyrinths, both in completely different ways, but they both became connected to it in different paths and ended up building a labyrinth in my parents' backyard. Um, and so, and I kind of, at that point was, I had young kids and I was very distracted with my life. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. You guys are doing another weird thing because they're always doing interesting, 
creative things together. Um, but, and then I started walking it with them and really connecting it with them and specifically with my mom. So my book, my mom in 2009 was diagnosed, diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and we had quite a long journey. She had Alzheimer's for 13 years from, um, start to her passing from diagnosis to passing. Uh, which is a pretty long time in Alzheimer's, usually adult or early onset goes much quicker. Uh, so it was a really unique experience that we had such a long time. And it was um, lots of different different emotions through that journey. Um, and I was supporting and helping my parents quite a bit and helping my dad navigate as my mom's um, cognition really started to to be challenged. And there was a labyrinth in our backyard. So I started walking it uh, with my mom and my dad quite a bit and really myself. And it really is the, the gift of that labyrinth was very powerful in helping me process. So there's a very healing thing very purposefully that happened in that specific labyrinth of my own healing journey of navigating um, all the emotions that happen when you go through a journey like Alzheimer's. So um, it was very wonderfully a space to hold and to heal me. So some of the things that I work with, with use, helping folks or helping my clients use the labyrinth comes from a real true heartfelt space that is walking the labyrinth. I healed myself. So, or it healed our journey. So my book is called Seeking Clarity in the Labyrinth, A Daughter's Journey Through Alzheimer's. Here's a, here it is. And I take folk, I take people in the book. It, we speak, I speak to Alzheimer's, some different specifics have happened in the journey of Alzheimer's, and then the use of the labyrinth and the use of our labyrinth to, to find a way to heal. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a labyrinth. Uh, it can be lots of different things. One of the biggest things that happens in um, when people are caregiving for Alzheimer's is they get super, super, uh, they lose their way. It is very hard to not get sucked into the stress and the, and it's actually, it's not just Alzheimer's, it's any time we're in a caregiving situation. So if we are caregiving for people that we love, it becomes, it, it makes us get very, feelings of being very lost. So the labyrinth is a perfect metaphor for the journey. Uh, what happens in a labyrinth, as you can see from my demonstration before, is you hit ends, you hit roadblocks. There's places that it feels like you are lost and you can't turn around. If you keep stepping forward, you eventually come to the center. And uh, the, the use of the activity to stop and to breathe and to calm down <laughs> um, is beneficial for anyone. And, um, and again, it's this beautiful metaphor for a journey, any journey through, through, um, through caregiving. So the specific experience that my, our experience was my mom's Alzheimer's in the middle of my mom having Alzheimer's, my uncle was diagnosed with dementia, with uh, Parkinson's, and then my aunt was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Her journey was quite short. She was about, it was about a five-year journey. Um, my uncle uh, had Parkinson's, and it was about 10 years or so. So in the time of my mom's, from start to finish, we also then had two more diagnoses that I supported and helped my cousins navigate. Um, and in a very short time, I lost three people to Alzheimer's in, and dementia. And Parkinson's is quite related to Alzheimer's. So, wow. so I have quite the experience with death as well and <laughs> utilizing ways and how we navigate dying too. So, <laughs> so it was pretty powerful. It was, and, and now um, through the writing of the book, through... Um, just my own personal journey, I feel very blessed and very much like um, I have my aunt and my mom walking with me all the time in support and love and help. I love that. I love that. You've written other books too. Share a little bit about those books and you've won some awards and recognition recently as well. Yeah. So Seeking Clarity, 
<laughs> just won an award, um, which I'm so proud of. I don't have the stickers yet on it. Um, and when I gave you the, my bio, I had to update my bio, Violet. Um, but that just award, it's called the Nautilus Award, which is um, it, Nautilus is a organization that really strives to ensure connecting um, stories and writers with uh, and, and striving for specific topics and driving those, um, connecting those. So I'm very proud of that. It's a silver award. Um, and then I've written in a couple of books, collaborative books, and the collaboration is such a different experience um, of writing with a group of people to tell a story. So the, and this award, this book also won an award, and this is called Planting the Seed. And this is a group of women that, and the side title of this is Lessons to Cultivate a Brighter Future, which I absolutely love. And in that, I write a story about my dad in the labyrinth. So one of the funny things about writing my, and preparing my first book is that I was writing a lot about my dad too, because I was writing about my mom and Alzheimer's, and I was writing about my dad because we were navigating this process together. And so um, the, that story is also actually about um, an experience we had in which the labyrinth also was very helpful with his specific health scare with my dad. So luckily he's fine and he's doing great now. And then um, I've written in a couple other collaboratives. This one is Notes from Motherland. And the byline of this one is The Wild Adventures of Raising Humans. And I write about my children and my mom and motherhood and um, the, the, sometimes the, the, some of the challenges we have with motherhood or my specific journey with motherhood included sometimes feeling really like I wasn't doing a good job and it's hard to be a mom. Um, <laughs> and, um, and some of the expectations I came to the table with being a mom from, I felt very, my mom was a, was a very present, very available, very, um, power, very connecting mom. She loved being a mother and she took the role and the, the, um, that, the, that, that role very seriously. And, um, because of that, I actually have quite a bit of expectations. So I dive into some of those feelings of how it's not always, it's not always rainbows and unicorns and motherhood can be sometimes challenging. And then by the light of the moon, um, really, uh, I dive deep into intuition and where the, the heartstrings of my sense of intuition comes from, which is also related to my mom. So, so it's been fun to write with other people. Um, I do, however, definitely the next project, writing project is another, um, it will be another, I need to, to dive deeper into the, the, it's kind of a precursor. Here's the, here's the, the teaser for the the next book it's a um it's about what happens after you lose someone you absolutely is important to you and you love in something like alzheimer's and how do you do that what comes next so my dad lost the he and my mom were super close and he lost her when he was 78 and um he still has a couple he has some years to live still and how does he go on and how is his daughter uh, how do I continue to support him, including making the decisions to age in place and how do we make really appropriate decisions for aging for him? And we're an aging population. We have a lot of elderly folks and um, people are becoming more creative of how we support our um, aging population and how we can do it with integrity and love and um, ensure we're seeing them. For, for the right reasons and the right way. Well, I love that you're sharing your stories with the world. I also love the fact that at Discover Your Spiritual Gifts, I think I have six authors, six published authors within the group. I've never, we've never had that. I'm an author. We have several folks. We've actually created an author page on our website where you can go out and check out their books and order their books. We have several authors and we also have some of them that are still writing. They're not published yet, but it's getting close. So that's exciting to know that we have people that are writing. I also have individuals that write articles 
for different publications as well. So they're published as well. So having people that are publishing things is really a cool opportunity to connect with these folks that are sharing their stories, their perspectives, their journeys, their thoughts. I think that's amazing to be able to have that in our center. I'm so excited that you joined us today. Share with us some of the things that you offer at the center, whether online or in person. We'll have your website at the bottom of the video so people can find you, but share with us some of the things that you offer. Sure. So we didn't talk about some of the things that I do at the Center of Violet, which I mean, you mentioned earlier. So, um, so really, if I could distill all the things that really are about who I am is I really w believe in my own journey, but also people helping find themselves. So um, I do offer sessions in the center. We do a lot of work with labyrinths. I also do therapeutic touch and Reiki and really energy work. I also not in my bio, but I need to update that is that I also do a lot of work with stone medicine and using the energy of rocks and crystals really to also connect with that energetic flow for people. Um, I also offer a belly dance class, which is super fun. It really helps, like it's an intuitive belly dance class. It really helps people move and get in their bodies and connect with their self, like really that heart self and that sacred center that we all are and through movement and through um, through moving our bodies, which is super powerful. Uh, there's, no, there's no mirrors in the center. So it's a really great way to go in and connect and move inward instead of seeing ourselves outward, which is something that often help, happens when we go to the gym or, or a Zumba class. I do love, I, I, Zumba, there's so many different forms of dance, and this is a way to connect with ourselves um, really inside. I also am offering a women's circle, so that's a monthly um, women's uh, opportunity for women, sisters, and women to connect, and really there's lots of different activities, including coloring and coloring labyrinths, because I have a lot of cool um, copies of labyrinth uh, worksheets. So they'll, there's going to be a lot of fun stuff that happens in that as well. I think it's awesome what you're offering. I, I look forward to seeing your journey grow and expand. What I've learned in my journey along the way is our lives prepare us to help others. So our experiences, our challenges, our obstacles, how we move through it, what we learn in that process, what we gain, what wisdom we come across, I think prepares us to be able to help others that may be going through the same thing. So somebody that may be supporting someone they love and caregiving, you know, Jessica would be a great contact to start working with and understanding how she went through it. And I get everybody has their own special journey, but sometimes it's so nice to know that we're not the only ones, that we're not alone, that we're not going through this and nobody else has been through it. It's nice to have somebody that's compassionate and understanding for what you are going through. But Jessica is a sweet soul. I know that and offers some amazing things that people can benefit from and definitely grow from. And so I love having her at the center. I think we both knew when we met that there would be a special connection between the two of us. Um, we tend to hang out with each other a little bit here and there. So uh, she attends some of my play classes and we have so much fun. This week we have unicorns coming and everybody's so excited to play with the unicorns. <laughs> Um, Jessica, thank you so much for being part of our podcast. I look forward. I'm sure we'll have you on here again as a guest because she's not done creating. We're going to see more and more from her. But if you go to her profile page, even on Discover Your Spiritual Gifts, you'll see her books and her offerings and where you can connect with her there, as well as her website that has been placed within this video Jessica, thank you for coming and hanging out with me this morning. Thank you. What a pleasure and so fun to talk about this stuff. I love it. <laughs> I love chatting with you too. So I hope you have a sacred and magical day. Please like, comment, and follow us on your favorite platforms. We're here to announce recently we won the gold 
uh, with the Covert Awards for our podcast. So we're excited too to be an award-winning podcast. So we hope that you will follow and gain many, many insights from our guests and those individuals that share their passions, their joys, and their inspirations. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for listening and watching.